Copyright Stanford University. All rights reserved.
Hello? Great. When are we technically? What are, we're starting now, right? 11, 11. Yeah. yeah. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. My name is Dan Greenwald. I'm on the Simca uh, board, and it's my pleasure today to introduce uh, Esteban Gonzalez Burchard. Uh, Esteban graduated from Stanford here with his MD in 1995, uh, after which he went to the Brigham and Women's Hospital for his uh, internal medicine training before returning to California for pulmonary and critical care at UCSF. And he's remained at UCSF since 2001 where he's been on faculty focusing on translational medicine and genomics. He's uh, director of their uh, health genes and uh, environments um, project, as well as the uh, uh, asthma origins project. Um, and his area of focus, as you'll learn today, is really on the ethnic and race-specific genetic factors that influence susceptibility to asthma and other diseases, as well as uh, response and toxicity to medications. And uh, recently, he was um, selected amongst very few scientists and physicians to be part of uh, President Obama's uh, Precision Medicine Initiative, um, which was announced this year at the State of the Union Address. So again, my pleasure. We'll have time for questions at the end of his talk. Thank you. Um, it's an honor and a privilege to be here. It's um, 
my career in medicine really started here, and I'm very, 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 very grateful for it. And I wasn't going to talk about it, but it, it is the Med Scholars Program, which I don't know if it's still in existence, um, was tremendous for launching my career. Um, so I'm going to give you a little background first about who I am, and, and that's going to set the stage for what I do. Um, I'm uh, born and raised in the Mission District of San Francisco, Hispanic mom, single, didn't speak English. Um, divorce was tough. She was a school teacher. So life was tough for us. Uh, money was tight. Um, had a lot of pride. One of the things that she said when I got an IOU for Christmas was, I'd rather see you dead than on welfare. So that kind of set the stage of, I'm, I'm going to go to school. Um, fortunately for me, if the Chinese family took me in, and I actually went to Chinese school for two years before it became chic. Uh, I was in an emergent pro emergent program, and uh, when I was eight, nine, ten, and eleven, I spoke Cantonese. It was fantastic. It just so happened the family that took me in was part of the Chinese mafia. So as a as a kid, <laughs> as a kid, it was awesome because I got free food, banquets. But then, as a kid, I was also part of the Golden Dragon Massacre. So I was like, wow. And once my mom realized that he was a mafia member because we saw him on TV being arrested, she's like, ah, oh, you got to stop that. So, um, and then I, I was a troubled teenager. Um, I had an anger management problem and beat everybody up. So uh, fortunately, I, I got into wrestling. My coach was on the 84 Olympic team. So it didn't mind, I didn't mind beating people up to get into California State Finals. But it allowed me to take discipline that I learned and apply it to, to medicine. And when I got to Stanford, I actually lived in a Jewish house for two years. I was a Shabbos goy. And, and why am I telling you all this? But it's awesome because in, in hindsight, you might think, well, wow, what a troubled youth. But now that I have kids, I couldn't pay for this stuff. Even if I wanted to send my kid to go see a Chinese immersion program and hang out with the mafia, I couldn't pay for that. I couldn't pay for them to live in a Jewish house. I couldn't pay for them to have an Olympic uh, coach on, as a wrestling team member and then uh, NCAA finalist as my study partner. But it really provided a unique lens of how I view medicine. And you're going to see that played out because I got some wonderful training at Stanford, wonderful training in translational research. And this is back before we knew it was called translational research. I was just doing it. And it was neat. So this is how I look at medicine now. Here's a clinical vignette. What if you were the patient? Mr. Sherman Chow, and we gave you a drug to treat your heart disease. Would you take it knowing that it doesn't work? So here's an example. Just happened, March of 2014. The Attorney General of Hawaii just sued Bristol Myers Squibb, Sanofi of Venice, for marketing a heart medication called Plavix. It's a blood thinner. You get a stroke or have a heart attack or a stent, you're going to get this drug. But what they knew, and they didn't disclose, is it doesn't work in 55% of Asians. It doesn't work in 65% of Pacific Islanders. The reason is you have to have a genetic variant to make the drug, what's called a prodrug, into an active drug. So if you have a heart attack and you're Asian, you go to the emergency room, you have a PTCA or a stent or a cabbage, you're supposed to get this medication, and it doesn't work, it's a placebo. The company knew it for 10 years, but when they went ahead and did it. And who lives in Hawaii? Asians. So the Attorney General of Hawaii sued because after marketing, looking at pre and post marketing, death rates for Asians who had presented with heart disease went up, where the death rates for Caucasian stayed flat. So they marketed the drug, for, they sued him for willful negligence because they had the information. Number two, for bankrupting, bank, uh, bankrupting Medicare coffers because the drug cost 100 times more than the regular drug, and they got it off formulary, and it was running the country or the state dry. So those, that's an example of why, how I look at those things. There's a black box warning now if you look at Plavix. Well, what about breast cancer? Here's Tanisha to reflect an African-American woman. You get a biopsy. Our blockbuster drug, Herceptin, doesn't work in blacks. You know why? Because they're triple negative. And the reason why they didn't know it didn't work in blacks is the vast majority of studies included European populations. This is down the street. My chancellor, my former chancellor, Susan Desmond Hellman, took Herceptin to the, to the market and brought it out to the masses 
but it doesn't work for the majority of people. So blockbuster drug just doesn't work for people. So this is problematic because the demographics of the United States have changed dramatically in the last 20, 30 years. Now every brand new kid that's born is likely to be Hispanic. In, the United, in California, 50% of the population are Hispanic. You wouldn't, you wouldn't uh, imagine that from this room, but that's the case. So the demo, the, these are the people that are paying for the NIH. This is our tax base that funds federal, federally funded research. Well, we recognized, and I was very pleased to be part of this, that in, in the 80s, we as physicians realized that, gee, women present for heart disease differently than men. And I was in the emergency rooms in Boston when they first began to realize all this, that women come in with chest pain, and very paternalistically, the, the ER physician would say, oh, take some Advil, go home, and they ended up dying in the parking lot. But it wasn't until women got involved in medicine and in research that we started recognizing that, gee, women present differently. Men present with the typical elephant on my chest, radiation on my left, left neck. Women present feeling nausea, clammy, punkish. And a lot of times those deer go out in the, hall, in the parking lot and you'll be fine, and then they died, and I was there. And I got to watch the change when Reagan initiated the Women's Health Initiative. In 1993, Clinton initiated the congressional mandate, and they asked, the, they challenged the nation, and they required the law that the NIH has to include women and minorities in all NIH-funded research. So it got implemented in 1994. Last summer, I had a bunch of students, so I asked the question, "Well, how have we done? What's the scorecard in the nation in the last 22 years?" And and here's what we found: it's shocking. It, since 1993, there have been 10,000 clinical trials funded by the National Cancer Institutes, your tax dollars. 150, less than 2% in 22 years, have been done in non-European populations. That's problematic. To this day, American Heart Association cardiovascular guidelines are based on white, old men. Uh, I'm not old yet, <laughs> so they don't apply to me, but <laughs> anyway. But the point is, we need to encourage community participation on all fronts. And there's multiple reasons to why we have this, not these numbers. But this is what we've just published. Um, this is what happens when you don't participate in research. I took an army of students, undergraduates, high school students, postdocs, PhDs, MDs, and we used the Freedom of Information Act. We used my inside connections at the NIH. We used PubMed. We created algorithms to track how many publications that are funded by the NIH had included non-European populations. What you can see on this axis is less than 5%. This is uh, the year, so here's 2013, the percentage. This is 5% right here. Out of all minorities, non-Europeans, maybe 5% max. And that includes Asians right here, Pacific Islanders, Indians from India, Asians. So out of the entire US population, 30 million, 300 million individuals, less than 5% of all NIH funded research has included non-European populations. This is not only a social justice problem because people are paying the taxes to fund the NIH, but it's a missed scientific opportunities. And that's what I'm gonna talk about. I, I believe in social justice, part of what we do, but I'm a scientist, and so I have to do things that are clinically actionable, and that's what we're going to do. When we look at modern genetic studies, and we published this in the journal Nature a couple years ago, 96% of all modern genetic studies, European populations. That's fine if you think all risk factors are ubiquitous and common across populations, but we know that they're not. So by not including diverse populations, we're missing out on other genetic risk factors that may explain some of the differences that we see in disease prevalence. For example, I study asthma, but asthma is just the platform, but it's emblematic of a common disease, is the most common pediatric chronic disorder in the world. And here what you see is the difference in prevalence in the U.S. population. Highest in Puerto Rican populations, lowest in Mexican populations, but 90% of all research focuses on Caucasian populations. Now, as an epidemiologist, you might say, well, that's due to reporting bias or confounding and so forth, but really hard to argue when you look at death rates. 
And this is actually very important for me because I did have the good fortune to go train in Boston. And when I was there, I was studying the genetics of asthma in minority populations, asthma severity. And I was shocked because if you go to Boston, there's like 10 hospitals all within a mile of each other. You got the best hospitals, Boston Children's Hospital, you got Brigham, BI, and so forth. When I was there, a young African-American teenager was found dead a block away from Boston Children, clutching his inhaler, died of an asthma attack. I was not surprised at the time, because at the time, I was studying genetics of asthma severity, and we identified a gene that was associated with severity, but it was 40% more frequent in African Americans. 40%. So when I looked at those data, it was an aha moment for me. For the first time in my career, could I postulate that perhaps, or hypothesize that perhaps, the difference in racial difference with respect to prevalence of asthma or death rates from asthma, perhaps could in part be explained by genetic differences. And I was very pleased because those data went on to get implemented in ongoing clinical trials going on now, based on race, based on genetics background. Now, in parallel, while we were doing our study, GlaxoSmithKline, and here's the albuterol inhaler that we were looking at. This is an inhaler, every kid gets it. Whether you're in downtown Palo Alto, Dubai, Hong Kong, Mexico City, if you have asthma, you're getting this. So we demonstrated that there are racial differences in response to medications, and that's, that's what we see um, across the nation, across the world. But what we didn't know was that GlaxoSmithKline, the company, was marketing a drug, and they called the SMART trial, in which they compared African Americans and Caucasians. And they had to abruptly hold the trial. But the FDA required that they include it in the package insert. Now, the package insert is something that we all get. Anytime we fill a medication, we get a package insert. And this happens to be one of the package inserts for one of the best asthma medications in the world, called CeraVent. Published by GlaxoSmithKline, they had some problems. They went ahead and published them, but they hid them. Because this is the package insert, we all get it as physicians, nurses, PharmDs, whatever. When we get it, it's the first thing we throw away, right? I'll tell you why you throw it away. Because it's huge. And here's the package insert for CeraVent. And you actually need a magnifying glass to see it. But I highlighted one po component, and I circled it, that if you read really closely, it says if you're African American and you take this medication, you've got an eight-fold increased risk of dying. Therefore, you have to take another medication to counteract the negative effects of a positive medication. The combination of a long-acting beta agonist and a long-acting inhaled corticosteroids is about 300 bucks a month. So when I went and bought that little albuterol inhaler for my class I teach, it cost me 50 bucks for albuterol. It should cost about 8 cents because it was developed in the early 50s. So, you know, the patent should have expired. But the point is, here we're beginning to see racial differences, and now there are about 100, 100 uh, drugs for which there are significant racial differences. So here's what we, my view of asthma. It's a complex disease, and that there are multiple factors that are helping to explain this observation. Social factors, environmental factors like tobacco, the built environment, obviously genetics, air pollution, and so forth. And so we ask the question is, you know, if we're talking so much smack about the lack of minority studies, and the NIH is saying it's impossible to include minorities, well, one of the things I learned when I came to Stanford was to think big. And I remember my dean telling me, you know, Esteban, this is back in 1990s when primary care was a fad, and, and Dr. Mendoza said, hey, you know, if you're going to do primary care, that's fine. I wasn't going to do primary care. He goes, but if you're going to do primary care, we want you to run the entire country of primary care physicians really to begin to think big. And that ethos got only better when I went to Harvard. Think big. So I sat there and said, well, what about all the studies in minority populations? I have a lot of skill sets that I bring to the table. I'm a Stanford grad. I could be pretty awesome. So what we did is we built the largest study of minority children in the United States. We recruited more than 10,000 individuals. And it was awesome. I got off my butt, went across all the world, the United States, Mexico, met with all my friends in a very Hispanic way, 
My word is my handshake and eye-to-eye -eye contact. And as a result of that ability, we built the largest minority study in the United States. All these sites throughout the United States, New York, Chicago, Puerto Rico, Mexico City, Houston, and the Bay Area. And the reason we did this was not because I had friends everybody. I, I do like going to Puerto Rico uh, <laughs> quite a bit. But we wanted to capitalize on the geographic variability with respect to air pollution, with respect to social factors, socioeconomic status, with respect to ancestry, and with respect to migration, acculturation, and so forth. We focused in on, on these major cities. These are heat maps for air pollution. And what you can see is that here's the San Francisco Bay Area. You see the darker color. Air pollution is really high on the 880 corridor. Air pollution is really high in the Bayview, Hunters Point area, the refineries. Here's a comparison for New York. Puerto Rico, who has the highest death rates and prevalence of asthma in the United States and the world, has the lowest amount of air pollution, which is surprising. And here's Chicago. But one of the first things that we did is we published this. It was the largest air pollution study in minorities, children ever published. And, and this is complex, so I'm going to walk you through it. When we looked at all the sites, we saw that for a given amount of air pollution, and it's never been proven before, does air pollution cause asthma? We demonstrated that for a given amount of air pollution, you had a 17 percent increased risk of developing air pollution on average. But I'm sorry, air, asthma. Um, but when we looked at African Americans, the risk was higher, 43 percent higher, or 43 percent. So it was a huge difference, a 26 percent difference. So in people, kids that are living side by side, their neighbors, if you're African American, you had a much higher risk of developing asthma than your non-African American neighbor sitting next door. So what that means on a public health level, we need to lower the EPA standards or the California Air Resources Board standards for air pollution to hit the common denominator. That's one thing. Here's where we're talking about including environmental factors, and we're going to get the genetics, but we can't do genetics in isolation. We have to look at it in the context of what are the other components that increase your risk of disease. So one of the cool things that we did, and here's I'm getting into uh, medical stuff, and this slide's a little dark, but basically we had all these kids breathe into a spirometer all over the United States and Mexico. We had them do the standard protocol, and we measured how tight their airways were. And this is standard spirometry. And here I have exhalation on the top, inspiration on the bottom. But then what we did is we gave them all a drug, albuterol, and then we repeated the spirometry. And the difference between the white and green is a quantitative measure of drug response. One of the coolest papers that we published was that the strongest predictor to this commonly used asthma medication was ethnic background. On the y-axis, we have drug response. The higher you are, the better. We have this magic line of red of a 12% change that we say is clinically significant. Below that means that you didn't have a good response. We still continue to give the medication to these guys, but knowing full well it doesn't work very well. But what you see is that Puerto Ricans who had the highest death rates had the lowest drug response. Same thing with African Americans. Mexicans matched uh, Caucasians. So this is, uh, is there a way we could turn up the slide a little bit? This is a little complex. Uh, or turn up the light a little bit. So when we talk about racially mixed populations in California or in the United States, you know, we have to look. We can't do this in isolation. This is really dark. Um, but basically, when you look at Hispanics and African Americans and a lot of Asian immigrants and Indians and even is that we're a racial mix. And so there are a couple things that happened in history 500 years ago. You know, Euro Europeans came from Europe to the New World. They imported African slaves. Native Americans were, were here to begin with. And so you really had the collision of three major racial groups. And I hope no one's colorblind here. But basically, the contemporary population here that's cleaning all of our garbage here at Stanford campus or in Palo Alto is a compilation of three major racial groups, African, Native American, and European. And the contemporary population is a mosaic. Each individual has a different color, representing that there's a different racial mix. Well, nowadays, it's really cool, because we can use genetic markers to precisely estimate your ancestry. We can use genetic markers to estimate where in the world you have the best match. So for example, if I, if I look at myself, my mother comes from uh, Mexico, and that matches to Native Americans all in North, North uh, America, all the way up to Northern Siberia. 
My father, more European, comes from Spain, that whole region, but it's pretty cool. Now with all these markers, just kind of like what you see on CSI when they find blood in the wall, they do a genetic test on it, they can tell you that person is Caucasian or that person is African American. We do the exact same thing using genetic markers, 23andMe does it really well. And here's an example of what we did where we looked at just Hispanics that we recruited for our own study. And in this case, each Hispanic had to identify themselves as 100% pure. Their parents were there, so we asked them to. They said they were pure. The grandparents had to be, four, four grandparents had to be the same ethnic background. And here, we have three different colors, red for Native American, yellow for European, green for African. Each bar represents an individual. And each color represents that individual's background. So here, individual number one, even though they said they're 100% Mexican, is 100% uh, Native American. This person is 100% European. I'm more like this individual. I'm an undercover brother, so I have some African in me. But the point is, we really don't know who we are. Whether you're European, whether you think you're Indian, whether you think you're Hispanic or African American, we're really a mix. We're a mosaic mix. And this is one of the reasons that was used to exclude racially mixed populations from previous genetic studies, because it led to what we call genetic confounding. But when I looked at this issue, I said, well, as an epidemiologist, there's a lot of variability in there, so we should capitalize it and use it to identify genes. And so that's what we did. Here's an example of African Americans, and um, from one to 100, Af green being Afri uh, African and yellow being European. But you can see individuals are like Obama over here, 50-50. Denzel Washington is probably over here, 90-10. But the point is, even though they're, we think they're a monolithic group, there's actually a lot of genetic variation in the population, and that could be leveraged to scientific advantage. So here's a cartoon of what your chromosomes might look like. And this is a karyotype. So here in, uh, this might be me. So here on chromosome one, I might have large chunks of European Af ancestry, large chunks of African ancestry, and large chunks of Native American ancestry. So the question is, can we leverage this now? So a really cool story is we asked the question, we know that there's huge differences in asthma prevalence and severity in the U.S. by race. So what we did is we, we took thousands of kids from uh, three major cohorts, one for Hispanics, one for African Americans. We assigned genetic ancestry at every region in the genome, and then we just did an association test to see if there are ancestral blocks that correlate with disease. And what, what Christine Yu did, who is a Stanford undergraduate, um, worked with Joanna Mountain, worked in my lab, um, was one of our best students at UCSF, got the uh, UC Regent Scholarship, and then got a first author paper in science this past May. Now as a postdoc here at Stanford, Chris Jean Yu. What he did is he demonstrated by looking at just chromosomal chunks of ancestry, he was able to identify a new genomic region that was associated with asthma, and that's what we see here. And this, this meets statistical significance. But when we looked at it closely, like what was under that peak? We found two genes, one called SMAD2 and one, one's called ZBTB7C. Uh, but that, that's cool. But what we're really interested in is, does it matter the type of ancestry at that particular gene? So for example, we know that diabetes prevalence is highest in Native Americans. So if you're looking for genes related to diabetes, do you think it matters if your insulin gene is European or Native American? That's the question. And that's the question we had here that Chris identified. Here on this line, we have this vertical line here, which is this pointer is not working. This is uh, our odds ratio. So here is no risk at all. Anything to the right is an increased risk. We demonstrated that ancestry at this particular gene, if you're Native American, you had an increased risk. Whereas if you're European, you had no risk at all or protective. If you had African American ancestry, you had no risk at all. So what, where is this going? What it suggests to us is that there might be genetic variants that are private to Native American populations that increase the risk for developing asthma. And that might help to explain differences in asthma prevalence between different Hispanic groups, as well as differences between different racial groups in the US. So this is nice, and it's population genetics, and it's all good and fun. But I'm a physician, and I'm a physician scientist. And I only care about things if they're clinically actionable. I don't like the intellectual theoretical stuff. I want something that I could take to the clinic and say, let's act on this. And so one of the, I, went, I showed you this, it's called spirometry. But the question is, 
In the United States, whether you know it or not, when you walk into a clinic, someone's looking at you and assigns a racial category to you. Did you know that? Mr. So-and-so comes in. Some person at the front desk who may or may not be trained how to assign racial categories will look at you and say, mm, uh, African-American, Caucasian, Asian. And we don't have those, and this is important because we have clinical standards based on race. But what happens if you're Indian from India? We don't have a standard for that, so mm, maybe we're going to call you black. What if you're brown and you're Mexican? Well, we have Mexican reference equations, but what if you're brown and you're Indian and you have no wherewithal, so you might call them Mexican? Well, that's actually important because in the U.S. we have clinical standards. So in Hen Haynes, they went out, the U.S. government went out and measured spirometry in thousands and thousands of people, kids and adults, and they, they came up with a reference standard. So why it's important, when you walk into a clinic, someone looks at you, and the tech gets that information, and you do spirometry, and the tech will say, there'll be a little pull down. Is he white? Is he black? Or is he Mexican? Now, if you're Asian, you're going to be classified, like Chinese Asian, you'd be classified as white, because we don't have reference equations for Chinese. We don't have reference equations for Indians. We don't have reference equations for uh, other ethnic subgroups. So you have to fit into one of these three boxes. You're either male or female, above 20 or below 20. So that's as important, OK? So the question I have for you is, if this person ha walked into your clinic, what would you call him? Is he white or is he black? <laughs> I know it sounds like a joke, but it's actually very important. What is he? You're a clinician. You have to make an educated guess. What is it? Why? He's 50% black, 50% white. He could have easily been qualified as white. And he specifically says, I'm not a black president. So what is he? You have to make a clinical decision. And this actually got thrown in my face when I was a young fellow, because I had an awesome experience. I, remember I told you how I grew up? I had a unique lens. I had an African-American firefighter come into my clinic on the job injury. The, he has an incentive to get disability benefits, right? Who wouldn't? On the job injury. The insurance company has an incentive not to pay. So the fire company sends them to me as an independent third party, and I have to make a decision, an agnostic decision. But then I thought to myself that, is he black or white? And I went, I was learning, I was learning the, how to do pulmonary function tests as a fellow. So I went with the tech and I realized, God, if the tech pulls down, does the white pull down, I can make him qualify for benefits. If he does a black pull down, he doesn't qualify. So I had a lot of responsibility in my hand. So I went ahead and made him qualify for benefits. <laughs> but I want to go back to this equation, this example. Do we use a standard reference, which is based on self-identified or assigned race, or do we use genetic ancestry? That was a valid question. Because I got my great, great, great genetics training at Stanford, I had my wonderful childhood experiences that you couldn't pay for, and I got wonderful training at Stanford and Harvard and UCSF, and I was able to ask the question, where does he fit? OK, and this is actually cool, because here's what we found. We measured genetic ancestry at a million markers in African Americans from a variety of different studies. Here we have lung function, so the higher you are, the better. Here you have percent African ancestry. If there is no association, we see a flat line. But what we see with increasing amounts of African ancestry, there's a negative correlation with uh, lung function. And what this suggests is that when we looked at an average male, 25 years old, 72 centimeters of height, there's a pull down. You, and then you just standardize everything. The only difference is he's white or is he black. And when we looked at the white equations, we would have got this prediction. If we looked at the black equation, we would have got this prediction. The problem is that depending upon your ancestry, so Obama would be right here, if we called him African American, we would have underestimated or overestimated his disease. If we called him uh, Caucasian, we would have overestimated his disease or underestimated his disease. If we had Denzel, he would have been way over here because he's 90% African. We would have overestimated his disease. And what we demonstrated, we, what's nice about this story is we published it in the New England Journal. And we demonstrated by using genetic ancestry, in addition to standard pulmonary equations, we could improve upon the accuracy of lung diagnosis 
by as much as 15%. We went ahead and replicated in five independent cohorts, because that's the way I roll, and, and it was neat. And we got that published in the journal, very nice editorial. But what was also cool is we went ahead, because no one believed us. And that was in 2010. So we said, and I'm a very big competitor. So I said, the hell with you guys. So we paired up with people at Stanford, paired up with the International Consortium, and we went ahead and did the largest study of Mexico Native Americans ever published. And it got into science. And the reason it got into the journal Science was because we were able to demonstrate that the type of ancestry you have influences your risk of disease. But what we also were able to demonstrate the type of Native American ancestry you have influences how accurate the diagnosis is of lung disease. So it was really the press, the, the lay press, the modern press picked it up because it was really an advancement towards precision medicine. I no longer care of you as an individual of large masses. I care of you as Mrs. So-and-so that's coming to my clinic with lung disease and we're fixing your lung disease. I don't know if you know the comedian Bernie Mac died in the transplant list. He's African American. Perhaps if he had a better diagnosis, he might have been put on the transplant list way far in advance before he died. So what happens when we make misdiagnosis? What if I told you you had a tumor and there's like a 15% chance I might get the diagnosis wrong? Would you guys live with that? I wouldn't. I wouldn't live with a 2% error rate. So we walk in knowing that at least for lung disease, kidney disease, when to treat, start treatment for prostate cancer, breast cancer, leukemia, all depends on race. When we look at cardiac function, all depends on race. So it's important for when you as a patient walk in, you need to know what you're signing up for. Because when we have misclassification, that's what basically I'm referring to, of lung measures, we get the diagnosis wrong. We get misdiagnosis, we get inappropriate referrals. You know anytime someone comes to the hospital, they have an increased risk of some sort of adverse effect like dying. Uh, they get allergic, uh, they get adverse reactions to medications. It influences disability ratings. I'm a pulmonologist, so we know that if your FEV1 is 71% of normal, you don't qualify for oxygen, but if it's 69, you do qualify. A 15% error rate will throw you one way or the other. I'm pretty passionate about it because my mom died of lung disease and I euthanized her, and we couldn't get her some of these treatments because technically they, she didn't qualify based on insurance criteria. That's bogus, and I'm going to bust that system up. That's one of my goals. So I'm going to wrap it up here. Um, but what I'm advocating for is that we, the United States taxpayers, we as stewards of the NIH, uh, and recently I got asked to be an advisor to Obama and Francis Collins, the head of the NIH, we need to be a little more inclusive. The U.S. right now, less than 40% um, of the population right now are non-Europeans. That's 40% of the tax base is coming from non-Europeans that fund the NIH. And I think it's important, not only on a social justice reason, but on a scientific justice reason, to make sure that we have inclusion of diverse populations, whether that's diverse groups, racially or ethnically diverse, but also women. We need to have women involved in clinical trials. We, need to make, we know that Ambien just got pulled because the dosing was designed for men, and for women it causes sleepwalking on airplanes, and it causes lots of bad things. So they modify the dose. It's just like dosing for adults versus children. Children are not little adults. We need to include them in all clinical trials to make sure we get the diagnosis right and the therapies right. So my point is, when we look at populations, we do studies, whether they're in Europe or in India, you cannot generalize them and just bring them back to the U.S. and say, well, there's one size fits all approach. It doesn't work. We're beginning to see it. The Plavig example is a good example of what happens. We, we need to include diversion, diverse populations because they're not just an extension of European populations. And we're missing out on scientific advances that could be generalizable to everybody. I want to open it up um, to, to questions. And um, I'm going to let my hair down. So I want this to be a pretty casual, <laughs> casual event. And I want to just thank my team. This is a wonderful team that I built over the last 16 years. But thank you for the opportunity to present. And it's what an honor to be here. And again, I want to emphasize how much the Stanford Med Scholar Program contributed to my, new, my career, which has been in existence now for over 23 years. So thank you very much. And welcome back to Stanford.
Yeah. We can use the mic. I just want to point out that the Med Scholars Program was, in fact, developed by the Medical Alumni Association, which many people don't realize, but it was the Stanford Medical Alumni Association that first started it. Thank you. I was a beneficiary of that. Yes. What's the progress on you know doing this actual testing for people? You know, my family has really strange reactions to medications, and we would dearly love to know, uh, have some proof that we do, so that we could get the proper medications. What progress is made in that general area? Um, I think we've made a lot of progress, but I think it's geographically situational. So, like if you're here in the Bay Area, which um, for the most part you will get genetically tested. If, if you ask, if you push. So my sister-in-law had breast cancer. She's Filipina. We wanted the BRCA gene tested, and they refused because she wasn't European. And I'm like, well, no, no, you don't know who you're dealing with. Uh, so I got it done. But my problem as a physician is not all of our patients have the wherewithal. They may be super smart, but they don't know. And a lot of our physicians don't know. And for years, UCSF has been trying to train the teacher but it hasn't been working, it's failed, and our new recruit, not recruit, tenure recruit from the NIH, Bob Nussbaum, who was number two in command, just quit UCSF because he was frustrated. When I took it, looked at it, you can't teach an old dog new trick, but what I did is I teach 122 students every quarter. I started brand new first year students, we started implementing genetic testing. Not just talking about it, we, we offered it to them that they can get genetically tested, we give them back their test results, we put it on the board, and we might say, you know, Susie's got an allergy to carbamazepine, or to Plavix, or so-and-so. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to get the kids, right when they're malleable, they're wide-eyed, bushy-tailed, they're receptive to everything. You get them after medical school, you get them after residency, they refuse to change. So that's, that, we're doing it on a grassroots level. We were the first at UCSF to start uh, pers personalized genetic testing for the kids. We're rolling it out to all schools at UCSF. We just had a giant precision medicine initiative. UCSF just dumped 140 million into precision medicine. Uh, we just stole a tool of Butte from Stanford. Um, and the goal there is to link all the UC medical systems together, the five medical centers, so we can uh, harvest the electronic medical record to improve care. 140 million for a cheap public school like UCSF is pretty big. It matches Obama's 165 million. Now, 165 million from Obama is a one-year down payment. The Precision Medicine Initiative that he announced in the uh, State of the Union is going to be a billion-dollar effort and probably be in existence for about 20 years. Tomorrow or Monday and Tuesday are our first face-to-face -face meetings. So, if you have wishes that you want me to tell Obama, or if you want me to get a selfie with him, I'll be happy to do it with. <laughs> anyway, go ahead. Um, is different in response of different uh, ethnic groups. Yeah. Is, that, is that due to liver met, uh, enzymes meta and rate of metabolism? Sure. It's a pretty awesome. So genetic variation, you know, in the past we talked about wild types and mutants. It's, that is a mis misnomer. There's nothing like called a mutation here. It's just genetic variation, different flavors. You know, Asians who have the mutation in the alcohol dehydrogenase, where they turn red when they drink alcohol, it's actually protective. But it's an allergic reaction to alcohol, it causes facial flushing, causes pruritus, it deters them from drinking. I don't have that, so I like drinking. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not good or bad, it's just, it, it is what it is. I have a thyroid problem. I got the mutation that doesn't metabolize Synthroid, and so every time I take a little dose, I go off the charts. If I have coffee on top of my Synthroid, I go crazy. But that's just me. Um, Tay-Sachs, there are a lot of genes. Bidil was created for African Americans. We know it, does, it works great. We know ACE inhibitors don't work as well for African Americans. And the FDA marketed the first African American only antihypertensive. So we're beginning to see black box warnings. If you look at this, this is a, one of the awesome stories. The, one of the biggest successes we've ever had in the field so far is with carbamazepine. But here's the package insert. I guarantee you none of you will read this. But if you do read it, you'll find out something interesting. And I want to hit home on this one. We know that pediatric epilepsy is a major problem. One of our top line drugs are, is a drug called carbamazepine. 
That drug causes a syndrome called Stevens-Johnson syndrome, where all your skin on the outside and inside sloughs off and you die of sepsis. So for a kid to die of sepsis is, is a travesty. We know it occurs more often in Asians. But as I told you, 96% of genetic studies have been done in non-European populations. And it wasn't until Dr. Chen in Taiwan did the first genetic study of Asian kids who had epilepsy, who were getting carbamazepine, they identified the gene, boom, they hit a brand new home run. They identified a gene on chromosome 6, HLA gene. So they went ahead and replicated that study in different countries in Asia, and they were able to demonstrate that, yes, if you have a particular flavor of the gene, it's actually an Asian flavor, that you have a 4,000-fold increased risk of developing Stevens-Johnson syndrome. So what they implemented was mandatory testing for any kid that was being considered for carbamazepine. And since they did that, they've ablated all carbamazepine-induced Stevens-Johnson syndrome in all of Asia. In the United States, we don't do that because we made it a cal the insurance companies made, it, made a calculated risk and decided to go empirically and we don't, Asians make up about 5% of the United States, so they made a calculation, well, it's not worth it for them to do genetic testing. So we just kind of go at it, wing it. If they develop a little rash, then we pull it. But we don't do genetic testing. If it's me, I demand the genetic testing. If it's me getting Plavix, I demand the genetic testing. You're not going to read this, but if you read this package insert, it starts off pretty slick. This is by the FDA. It says, if you're of Asian ancestry, it starts off with Asian ethnicity. But then you could be white and have lived in Hong Kong as an expat, so then that doesn't count. Then it says if you're of Asian ancestry, you're at risk. If you read further, it says if you're of Asian ancestry at the HLA B locus, then you need to get genetically tested. It says it right here. And that's fascinating. This is the home run and the quintessential example of where we want to go. Because I actually don't care what you think you are if you're white, black, Hispanic. I actually care what your ancestry is, a particular gene. So if we can focus in on your gene, we can forget this whole idea of race, ethnicity, and just identify the variants that will be predictive of drug response. We do that for lung cancer. If you're Asian, you don't smoke, you're female, you walk into my lung cancer clinic, I know I'd be willing to bet your life on what your genetic mutation is. And what's even better is there's a drug that works just for you. And it gives you six more months of life called gemfitinib. Awesome based on the genetics of the tumor. And that's what we're trying to get to. Yes? OK, let's do something very practical for me. Uh, I work in a Native American clinic. So do you have an opinion on, what, on who should be genetically tested regarding what medications? Well, there are a lot of medications that have, about 100 medications that have racial warnings right now. Mm -hmm. And that list is going to go up as we are more inclusive. Part of Obama's big precision medicine initiative is to reflect the demographics of the United States. So I think we're going to find out a lot of information by that. Native Americans are tough because there's been a lot of bad political history between them and the U.S. government and the National Institutes of Health. The U.S. government and the NIH didn't do a good job, and they threw up their hands and said, well, forget it. You don't want to participate, don't participate. So they weren't included in the original genetic studies called the HapMap or the Human Genome Project. And that was one of the neat things about our paper of science is we couldn't access Native Americans in the US. So we just said, hey, we got a million Native Americans in Mexico. Let's do it. And actually, the results from there are generalizable to the US. So it's the largest Native American study ever published. And that's why I got into science. Yes. Um, so I have a question. Uh, in certain cases, when there is a genetic mutation, and, and it's very clear that it is either there or not. Uh, I can, there are examples in oncology, for example, where you can personalize treatments very yeah. precisely. Um, what about when you get in situations where what you're measuring is the expression levels of a biomarker in the yeah. serum, for example, and, and you have uh, pharmaceutical products that have a range of responses depending on the intensity of, that, of the expression of that biomarker. Do you have any, any thoughts on how those medicines ought to be regulated and what should be in the USPI, the package insert, in those situations where patients express the biomarker at different levels and therefore the therapeutic intervention can have a degree of effects on those patients? Mm -hmm. Well, the good example I remember being here at Stanford is PSA, where, right? We have different standards for blacks versus whites. For blacks, the standard is you can have a high PSA, we won't start treatment. 
but what is black versus white, right? I'm 10% I'm African, Do I, am I black or am I white? It really matters what my ancestry is at my PSA gene, for example. Yeah. So the FDA is struggling with this. In fact, the FDA a couple years ago just held a meeting in Puerto Rico of all the FDAs in the Americas. So Brazil, all those countries, where we do clinical trials, Canada, United States, Mexico. And they all came here and said, well, we as the United States are doing all these trials in Brazil. But if you've ever been to Brazil, you know it's racially mixed. It's huge. It's like a rainbow, right? So how do we take clinical trials that are done there and generalize them? Do we measure ancestry? Well, most companies don't because that's an additional expense of getting the blood, having to do genetic testing. But now a lot of companies are. They just are not releasing the data. So I think the field is moving that way. The FTA is requiring it. The FTA is requiring that we include women. The FTA is requiring that we include non-European population. And the FTA is requiring that we include kids. So as this information gets out there, it's going to be incorporated. It's slow to get out there because most people have, most of us as physicians, we took one class of genetics. I took it from Hunt Willard in 1990. Uh, uh, um, but most of us don't know genetics. And it's fascinating because down the street, we're, we are in Mecca here. This, this is Mecca. The Bay Area is Mecca. We have genomic health. You know what genomic health is doing? Awesome. For breast cancer, we're getting not, we have stages for breast cancer, you know, stage 1, 2, 3, and then 1A, 1B. But now what we can do is we do a biopsy of the breast, and we can look at gene expression patterns. And based on your gene expression pattern, it dictates whether or not you would benefit from adjuvant therapy. And other places like St. Jude's in, in uh, Memphis, they're looking at ancestry and they noticed that Mexican kids didn't respond well to chemotherapy that had acute lymphocytic leukemia. So what they demonstrated was that if you were Mexican and had more than 25% ancestry, you benefited from two extra rounds of chemotherapy. And what, why that was important, because they proved to the insurance company by this genetic marker, it, it validates, it justifies two extra days in hospital, two extra courses, so it's like $10,000 each, for kids that were refractory to uh, ALL therapy. We're doing this thing with Genentech right now, looking at biomarkers in children to identify kids that are refractory to traditional asthma therapies. We're not only using genetics, but we're using protein biomarkers. We're using other factors. We're, we're using everything in our toolbox to identify kids that are going to be refractory or high-end utilizers of healthcare. That's where we're headed. And I'm, I'm so thrilled that we're, we collectively as a field are moving that way. Okay, we're going to break for lunch now. I oh, think we Dr. Mendoza had a question? question. He's the boss. No, no. Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was spectacular. Thank you.